OK. Welcome, everyone. I think I've got my breath back from the mad dash for a VGA adapter. So I think we're good to go. Right, so diversity when playing life on easy. Um, there's a few women in the room. This talk isn't really aimed at you. This is aimed at people who are not yet far enough down the road of understanding diversity to realize why they maybe need to hear a diversity talk from someone who doesn't look like them. Please do not be scared if you look like me. This is about the journey that I have taken. And I'm hoping to drag a lot of you along on the understanding of how it can help your community, how it can help yourself as a person, and why this stuff really matters. So, playing life. Has anyone read this blog post about the analogy of life as a computer game? Lots of shaking of the heads. OK. So the idea of this post and this analogy is that it is perfectly possible to play a computer game on easy and still die. You can play a computer game on easy, not complete the level, not kill the bad guys, not solve the puzzle. Equally, you can play a computer game on hard and still ace it, still win everything. This is not saying that playing life on easy means that you automatically win. It's not saying that playing life on hard means that you can't win. It's just saying that for different people, you may find that you have certain advantages, certain disadvantages that crop up. It can still be really hard. You can still fail. You can still win. But we're not necessarily all in it together, and it's not necessarily obvious. For those of, those of you who grew up playing Doom, I don't know if anyone can remember what happened on the different difficulty levels. You'd start off, and there's a monster. You're like, wow, this is really hard. And then you'd put it up to Nightmare, and you'd start off, and there's 100 monsters. There's still monsters to kill. But unless you pushed up that difficulty level, you didn't necessarily notice that it was, there were ways for it to be harder. It has been suggested that being a straight, white, male, guy, especially from a middle class background, especially with a fairly well paying tech job, is playing life on easy. We can still fail. We can still mess up. A great many of us do. A great many of us struggle. But that's not to say that other people find it just that easy. Most other people find it a bit harder. So what I'm going to try and cover today is some of the ways that I have inadvertently or deliberately pushed up the difficulty seti for myself for a short while. Things that I've found that have made my teams work better, my projects work better, some of the mistakes I've made, you can all laugh along with some of the things that I've done, and hopefully give you some pointers on things you might want to look into more. So first one, pretty obvious one, time zones. So. We're here in the States. I don't know how many people here have tried working with a team in India. OK. Anyone tried working with a team in Australia? OK. Have you tried to get support from them on a Friday? And they're at the beach because it's Saturday with the Australians. If you're working with Indians, you're like, hey, it's lunchtime. Why aren't they responding to my, to my emails? Well, they've gone home. If you're on an open source project, especially one at the ASF, we're all volunteers, you've got to be aware of the fact that different people are going to be working different times. It may be a public holiday in another country. It may be someone who's only volunteering, only working on their off hours. So you need to be, be sensitive to different times. If you're working with, anyone work with teams in the Middle East? UAE, anything like that? OK, they have a different weekend. There are, there are all these different things that can go on that might mean that when you think someone is being lazy because they're not responding to your email, it's not that they're being lazy. It's that you just haven't thought through. OK. So if, if, um, if you're working with people on your project who are volunteers, they are not going to respond during office hours. 
if you are working as a volunteer and most of the people on your project are paid, they're probably not going to respond on a Sunday afternoon. You just need to think about what's going on and then make sure that when you're designing your communication systems, you're inclusive of that. If you are requiring everyone to be stood around one single water cooler, one single office desk for a stand-up, that is going to be very, very exclusionary to other people. Equally, if you're doing everything online, on a Slack, on an IRC, at one specific point in time of the day, if you're doing it on a Friday afternoon, US Pacific time, you're probably only going to get volunteers from Australia joining because they're the ones who are now on their Saturday morning and can join in. But most of the rest of the world is going to be doing other things, going to be asleep. So don't just assume that, hey, we took our team stand up and instead of it being all around the room, we moved it onto Slack. So suddenly we're all welcoming of volunteers from all around the world. That, that still not solved it. Mailing lists and waiting a long time are tedious, but in many ways they can be the best thing. Or you just have to shift your stand up around the world. Take it in turns to be the one that's doing it at three in the morning. Languages, another challenge here. You can be the odd one out if you're working in another language. I'm looking around the room. I'm guessing most people here speak English as a first language. Anyone here speak English as a second language? Okay. Anyone else here speak another language as a second language? We've got any? Got a few. Okay. If you've not tried working in a different language, it can be a bit of a shock about how hard it is. Um, you may think that because most people involved are coders and most code is written in English, that means that everyone involved can speak English. It's not the case. Um, just because you understand how to write the variable doesn't necessarily mean you automatically understand the rest of the language. If you can go into um, a Japanese restaurant and point at a soup on the menu and make it appear, that does not mean you are fluent in Japanese. It means you have a coping mechanism by pointing at the pictures. It might mean that you have a coping mechanism where you have a book on your desk that says, for this concept, the letters that you type in are this. You may be typing English words in, but that doesn't automatically mean that you're going to understand it. Okay. So another one to be aware of is being the odd one out. This can really affect how you work and how you behave. So one example, a few years ago, I used to work for a web development agency in the UK that mostly worked with charities. And most of the people in the company at the time I joined looked like me, were guys. We had one client who was a very big London-based charity. And we were working mostly with the IT team there on developing a piece of software for them. So went to the first meeting with the client and walked in. They went, oh, you're here to see IT. And we're like, we haven't even introduced ourselves. How did you know? And they're like, yeah, IT are the two guys in the corner. And you just kind of walked into the room and it's like, all women, all women, all women, all women, all women. There's just two guys in the corner. All of the toilets in the building, except for one, were women's toilets. So if you want to go to the toilet as a man, you had to walk this long, complicated route. You had to go and find that one toilet. And you really felt self-conscious about the fact that you were one of the very few guys there, that everything was set up for people other than you. Now, if you can try and imagine turning that on its head, for most of the women in IT, that is their experience every single day. They are constantly being reminded of the fact that they're different. If you have one person on your team who is of a different nationality, different first language, different ethnicity, they're always being reminded of that being different. Who's seen the ex-KCD comic about guys and women doing maths? Anyone seen it? I should probably put that in. But you, people will sometimes assume that you are representative when you are the only person of a specific type there. And that gets quite draining. Okay. Another thing to be aware of is mistakes no one mentions until you find out and then you feel silly. So in English, you say, I'd say, 
Hi, I'm Nick. In French, you say, je m'appelle Nick. I am called Nick. You don't say, je suis Nick. Lots of people, apparently, a co-working space I used to go to, would find it very quaint and amusing that I made this mistake. And they let me keep making it for three months. And then when someone pointed this out, I was like, oh god, I just must have seemed like this complete idiot. And it really knocked my confidence for about two weeks. For about two weeks, I wasn't really confident talking to these people again who I've been talking to and making this same obvious mistake for months. And it just kind of caught me off guard. You need to be aware that people in your team who don't look like you, who don't speak like you, they can be making mistakes, they can be finding them out, and it can be knocking their confidence. The reason that the Spanish guy in your team is quite quiet in the stand-up. It's not because he's stupid. It's because he's worried about his language. He's worried about the time that he said something and you all laughed. The American in your team, and how many Americans here have been to the UK? Okay. Um, did you try saying that you'd spilt something on your pants or you'd left your pants at home and everyone sniggered? You might not have noticed that. Okay, so in America, these are pants. In Britain, the thing underneath the underwear, that's the pants. <laughs> you can get a very different reaction just from some simple words, even when we're sharing a language, sharing much of a culture. And I can tell you that having had American friends make that mistake, they're a lot more cautious for most of the rest of that day until they go and find that BuzzFeed article about amusing linguistic mistakes between British English and American English. But for the moment the entire room has laughed at them, they're like, oh, I'm just not going to say anything at all. Be aware that these things are going on all the time to other people and it can be affecting them, can be meaning why they're not joining your community, why they're not um, speaking. So, got cultural and linguistic mistakes. Another thing that can be quite tiring, mentioned already, is when you are taken to be representative. When I was at a co-working space in France, and everyone was like, what do the British think? And I'm like, I cannot represent the entirety of 60 million people of the British Isles through myself. Um, but everyone's like, oh, Nick, you're the Brit. What's it like? Try and turn that around. Imagine someone saying, oh, hey, Jenny, what do all women think? That sort of thing can get really tiring, just being held up as the example and being quizzed all the time. Makes you, makes you really feel different. You might have thought you were fitting in, and they're like, oh, let's just ask the Brit that thing. And you're like, oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not like them. Again, it can knock your confidence. It can make you unwilling to talk. OK, another thing is people act differently in different situations. Um, I don't know if anyone knows any Spanish speakers, but you may notice that if you have any friends who are Spanish speakers, their face often looks different when they're talking Spanish, when they're talking English. Just the, the kind of mouth movements that get used can make them look different. If I'm hanging out with a load of French people, I have a tendency to use my arms more. And also, when I'm speaking, so this isn't necessarily a, a fair example. Um, if I'm hanging out with a lot of older people, I'll behave differently to hanging out with some younger people. And I tend to do that a little bit self-consciously. I'm like, well, what's everyone else doing? How should I react? But again, it's making me think differently. So if you've got someone in your team who is different to the rest of you, and you see them there, and then you see them go out with some of their friends, you'll see them behave differently. They're, they're self-consciously adjusting their behavior to fit the group. So you might say, hey, it's easy. Everyone here is the same, and even the woman in our team is the same. That's not necessarily the case. They're often changing their behavior, and that's taking a toll. If they're thinking about how to behave like all the middle-aged white guys, they're not necessarily thinking as much about what they're going to say in the conversation. They might be self-consciously adjusting their behavior, saying a bit less. And that's taking its toll. There's less time available to join in the coding. Right. Another thing is the challenge of being the first. So, if you are the first person of your gender, nationality, language group, or whatever to be involved in a community, 
it can be quite hard because there's no one around to ask. So I'm going to pick on David here for a sec. So David is on one of the same projects as me and lives in the same town as me. So when David wanted to get involved in the project, it was really easy. I was in the same time zone. We have a number of friends in common. We work really close to each other, and we could just go out for a drink. So if he had any problems, there was that immediate support network of someone like him available. And unsurprisingly, we managed to get him from someone who turned up on the mailing list with a problem to commit her really quickly. If you are the only person in your country involved in the project, and the only person in your linguistic group involved in the project, it can be really, really tough to find anyone who's going to be there to tell you how to get involved, how to deal with these problems, how to deal with the time zone, how to deal with the language, how to deal with mistakes, how to deal with the fact that you've just got this email from an American that seems really threatening because you've misunderstood two words, and that was actually some linguistic joke from an 80s TV show that you've never even heard of that made it seem really threatening, but actually was someone being jokey and friendly. If you've not got that peer support around you, it can be really hard. Um, so a company I used to work called Torchbox. When I joined, it was about 20% women. And as it grew, it tended to stay at about 20% women for a while. And then without really making any big effort, just through happenstance and recommendations, it got to about 35% women. And then it went to 50% women. There was this magic trigger point where there were enough women that more women were willing to join. Women who wouldn't go and be the first one, but were quite happy to be the 17th one, came in and joined. And the company very quickly pivoted into near parity. And no one sat around and decided on this. I don't think the women necessarily consciously said, oh, I'm not going to go and work there. But being the first was scary to a lot of them. And we had to get a number of women in who were willing to be first until we built up that network, that peer support, to bring the rest in and get to parity. So be aware that it can be a lot of effort to support those new people, but it will pay off. You can make your community more diverse by supporting and really looking after and nurturing the people willing to put up with being first, and then they can bring more in. Okay, so a bit more on language, also known as laugh at Nick when he's in France. So, speaking in a second or third language is more tiring than speaking in your native language potentially a lot more. Um, if I'm in France and I'm trying to speak in French the whole day, I get to about 5 o'clock and turn into a gibbering wreck. If I just push on through and keep going, then about 7 o'clock I can't even talk English. It's quite incredible. You don't think that it's being tiring, but you just find yourself a lot more drained. That constantly thinking, that constantly translating, flipping back and forth, the context shifting, it can really tire you out. So if you've got someone involved on your team in your project who doesn't speak English as a first language, they're probably putting more effort in for the same level of participation. They're finding it harder. And if you're having this massive long mailing list rant at 15 emails an hour, not naming any names, but maybe bored at or members at on certain bad days, and you've got people who are having to mentally translate this, that can be really draining. And so even if for some of you, you're like, well, I can kind of follow all that and still get a couple of patches in, people who aren't doing English as a first language may be struggling. Maybe just reading the mailing list has taken all their available energy and they've got nothing left. So be, be respectful of them. Another challenge, getting a word in. I can be in a group of French speakers and follow the entire conversation, but it takes me maybe half a second longer than the native speakers to think up the thing I want to say to join in the conversation. And in a fast-moving group, you've missed that window, that pause, where it was right, OK, who's going to go next? And you're like, OK, oh, yeah, I know. I, I can remember the vocab. I okay, missed it. OK, uh, talking away. Yeah, yeah, actually, I've got something to say on that. What's the word for community? OK, yeah, OK, missed it. And I can be in a group where I understand everything. I can be sat there for an hour, and I can have lots of things to say that I never get to say 
because it's just taking me that moment longer to think of the right words, to open my mouth and start talking. And the community's moved on. The next person speaking, I've missed my chance to get a word in. Which is really quite frustrating. Because I'm like, hey, I want to join in. I want to say something. But I just, just missed it, missed it. If you're having in-person meetings, allow a little bit of extra time. Allow a bit of extra time for people who don't have English as a first language and need a little bit longer. Allow a bit of extra time for people who are a bit shyer. If you are very forceful and outgoing and bolshy, you may be willing to sit down and go, hey, I haven't actually met you, but hi. Matt, nice to meet you. Yeah, some random guy I've never met before, but I'm going to say hi. If, if I'm a little bit more introverted, either by nature or just because I'm in another country speaking another language. I'm the only one like me. And I'm a bit like, oh, just, just kind of wait a bit. If you're looking around the table, looking around the discussion, spotting the people who are a bit less hesitant, sorry, a bit more hesitant to join in, and be welcoming to them. Say, hey, Dave, you haven't really said anything for a while. Do you, do, do you, do you want to join in, or should we just get you another coffee, wake you up? But you know, just spot that you're ignoring people. People who are feeling different, people who are feeling tired, maybe not willing to join in, even though they've got interesting things to say. Maybe they're going to have a really interesting point. Maybe they'll be like, hey, Nick, you know that test you added last week? You do know that not everyone in the world has UTC and local time as the same? And that test now fails for me. And I'm like, what? Everyone lives in Oxford. Everyone has UTC and local time the same for half the year. Incidentally, that was a bug that happened three years on the trot when I was working for a certain UK-based enterprise software company because all the developers were in the UK or Portugal, which was also a cheat. But yeah, everyone was all in places. And it's every March on that magic Sunday, the build failed because one of us had made that assumption. If we'd had a developer running the test suite anywhere else in the world, we'd have caught that. But we were just this little bit too much of a monoculture. So look out for the people who are different, who are struggling to speak. Give them the chance, because they may well have something interesting and different that you haven't thought of that will give you the new use case, point out the bug that you haven't seen. Okay. Another issue for people in other languages is it can be quite hard for them to make a joke. Because people will assume that they've made a mistake, not that they're telling a joke which can be quite disheartening. If you've kind of come up with this really funny joke with a play on words, and you say it, and it's completely right, and everyone's like, no, no, it's, it's not that, it's this. You're like, no, no, that was the joke, that was the point. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, that was quite funny. We just thought you made a mistake. And you do that three or four times, and you're like, I'm just, I'm just giving up making jokes to my French friends. It's just not worth the effort. <laughs> Miss the punchline. But then if you're interacting with me on a French mailing list, you might be like, Nick's really dull. He's not making any jokes. Why is he being so straight? Why is he using such precise, boring language? Well, because I got burnt, and then no one found the joke funny, and then I gave up. But then you end up with a different perception of me if you speak to me in English to in French. So you might be like, oh, that new person, they're just, they're just no fun. No, they, they've been burnt too much. Can't try and be welcoming. Be aware of it. Written versus spoken, another one. You might have someone who's really good on the mailing list terrified to join in on your stand-up Google Hangout um, scrum thing. You might be like, hey, we've got all these guys in China, and we went to this huge effort to make our daily stand-up be at the right time for them to join in, and they all just look there like rabbits in a headlight. But I know they speak English because they're always writing to me on the mailing list. Well, maybe not. Maybe they're really good at written English and don't have the confidence to speak. There's an issue with the French school system where most of the people in France learning English don't get to practice it very much. And when they're practicing it, it's almost never with native speakers. So when you meet someone in France and you're like, oh, can we switch to English for a minute? Because I'm just feeling really tired. And they're like, no, my English is bad. And you're like, what? But I've seen an email from you. And you get talking to them. And actually, it's really good, but they're lacking the confidence. So don't assume that because people write well, they can speak well. Don't assume that people who can speak well can write well. 
And don't assume that magically making your daily stand-up happen in the right time zone is going to be all it takes to get them involved. Okay, trying new things. One of the big issues with getting new people involved in your community is a sort of inherent built-in negativity most of us have about things outside our comfort zone. Go, Dave, why don't you get involved in one of the big data projects? And Dave might be like, oh, well, I really like all the content stuff, but I'd be rubbish on the huge big data, too many machines. No, I won't give it a try. I'll just stick in my own happy little comfort zone. So, speaking, who here has done what I'm currently done and stand up in front of a bunch of strangers and spouted off, hopefully informing them? OK, we've got quite a, quite a number. Was it easy the first time? <laughs> Were you pretty terrified that first time you stood up with the microphone? OK, if you're trying to get more people in your community involved in presenting, you have to kind of hold their hand. Don't just be like, hey, I can speak. Everyone can speak. Well, yeah, they can, but they need some help first. If you're trying to get people out of that comfort zone and into something else, you're going to need to give them some support some advice, and be mindful of people who even then aren't willing to do it. OK, another one, design. I used to think I had no eye for design. I still think I have no eye for design. But for some reason, people keep asking me to help knock up standard templates for a lot of these conferences. Because even though I could never get a job in graphic design, I am apparently better at it than many other coders. But that's fine, because we're not trying to enter a slide presentation making competition. We're trying to get some information across. You don't have to be the world expert in it. If you are the best person in the group of volunteers you have available, that's more than good enough. Don't let that perfection get in the way of trying something new, especially if there's some other people around to help you out. Another thing that affects a lot of newcomers is being almost there but not knowing it. So think back, some of you a little way, some of you a long way, to maths classes in school. Think of one of those really long problems where you're working through for a whole page and you get to the bottom and you're like, no, I, I'm almost, no, I can't, it's, I failed. I can't, I can't solve this problem. And then you give it to your teacher and they're like, there's just one more line you have to put in, and then you've got the answer. You're like, oh, wow, never thought of that. Everyone, please say that I wasn't the only one to do this. Everyone, <laughs> can you all remember that, that kind of maths problem? Got some people shaking their heads. I think maybe you're all just maths geniuses. Here, let's try another one. Learning a new computer game. You ever had that thing where you're doing a puzzle game, and you, you kind of doing this puzzle for two hours, and then you're like, oh, I'm going to have to cheat, and you just Google. And you're like, oh, that picture was a button. OK, all right, I just complete the level. And you were almost there, and you spent hours struggling without realizing that last little bit that you could, that, that you're almost there. If that's happening to you in open source or in work, that's going to knock your confidence. If you can't do three puzzles in a row in a game, you're probably going to give up. Be like, no, I'm, that game's rubbish. Depending on how confident you are, you'll either say, I'm rubbish at this game, or that game is rubbish. But the end result is still the same. You're going to stop playing it. If you're trying to welcome someone different into a new open source community, to a new team at work, and they struggle three times, they're probably going to give up and walk away. They're going to walk away from your community, and you've just lost that new contributor. And what's more, you might have just lost that first mover contributor. That person who was willing to stick out and put up with a lot of stuff that would have helped bring in more people from that underrepresented group. So try and give extra support to newbies. Don't be like, hey, surely everyone knows this is a really obvious thing. Oh, why have we had another person saying, I can't get the build to work? It's just, oh, they're, they're rubbish. I'm just going to 
tell them in long, lengthy detail how stupid they are on the mailing list. Maybe we go, could it just be that we have assumed too much about people trying to get started with our project? Maybe we should be nice to this person and add in that extra missing step in the documentation that trips everyone over, rather than like, I can make it compile, Maven's not very hard, you're stupid. Just think about that experience when you're playing a new game, doing a math problem for the first time, and someone's almost there, and help them through that, and then ideally also get them to fix the documentation. Because the people that are struggling and have just solved it are often the best place to help other new people in through that gap. Key thing for new people coming to new communities is positive first feedback. Who here uses Instagram? Okay. You go on Instagram, you put up a photo, you put in a couple of hashtags, and unless you are doing it on a public holiday at the wrong time of night with the wrong hashtag, within about a minute or two, you start getting the little likes come through. That first photo you took maybe isn't very good. Maybe you could have done some more stuff with filters. Maybe you haven't quite worked out the hashtags. But you're still going to get likes. Because people are going to be browsing through, seeing it, and be like, yeah, that's a good photo. You get likes. You get little mini dopamine hits, but you get that first little bit of feedback. I put a photo up. Hey, someone actually likes it. OK, I'll go and take some more photos. I'll go and share some more photos. That first time that you join the community, you get positive feedback quickly. Not, hey, I, I found this project, and I opened a pull request, and it got ignored for six months, and then someone closed it without talking to me because they'd moved on. That's, that's bad first experience. That turn up, get the likes, get involved. Someone might come along later and be like, hey, you really ought to turn down the white balance and put some more hashtags on, and here's an introduction to digital photography that you'll find really useful. That can come later, but you get them hooked. Stack Exchange sites accept Stack Overflow. OK, let's just another show of hands. Who here uses Stack Overflow? OK. Who here uses any other site on the network? Serverful, travel, expatriates, French, Christianity, Islam, cooking, aviation, anything like that? OK. The experience on most of the other sites can be quite different. You turn up, and they'll be like, hey, welcome. It's great post. Have you had a look at this one over there? It might solve your issue. But if not, can you clarify a little bit? Help us hone in. It's really welcoming. If you turn up on Stack Overflow with pretty much anything less than a PhD thesis, you will get four downvotes, three edits, and a close. Possibly, the close will be to the duplicate that solves your problem. Other times, it's to a duplicate that solves what you'd written that wasn't actually quite your problem. And then you try again. And you get downvote, downvote, close. And then you go and try a third time, and it won't let you because you've been banned. Because your reputation is too low, and you've had too much negative feedback. And you just be like, what am I even bothering with? That first experience on Stack Overflow is kind of optimized for the attention of the experts not for the newbie. You don't get a lot of help. You kind of have to find out the hard way. If you look on the meta Stack Overflow, which is the discussion site for admin, you'll see lots of newbies coming in and be like, what did I do wrong? And someone was like, oh, actually, yeah. So you were nearly there. But what you need to do is go and read this help text here. And then you need to go and see that duplicate there and explain why that duplicate isn't actually your problem. And then they edit the question, it gets reopened, and three weeks later, they've got a good rating, and you know, it's all been good. But a lot of people, that first experience is just downvote, downvote, comment that seems to say I'm an idiot, comment that seems to say I'm an idiot, close vote that closes on a duplicate of something else. And you just, it's just really depressing. If the experience of contributing to your project is like that, you're going to lose those people. If you immediately close their JIRA as a duplicate, and that's it. If you close their pull request without commenting on it, or if you ignore it, they're not going to come back. 
if you at least say, hey, thanks for that. It turns out we solved that two releases ago, but we used a slightly different name. We're calling it formula evaluation, but you were trying to do um, data calculations, but that's okay, that's the same thing, it's over here. Then you haven't scared off that first person. And what's more, someone else coming in from Google who expressed the problem the same way as that newbie, which isn't the way that your project expresses it, sees it and they see a nice, friendly, welcoming community that's helping point people, not like, oh God, I'm not gonna join them. They were just really rude to that person who's having the same problem that I've got. Yeah, I've got the answer, but no, I'm gonna go and find someone else to spend my time with. So think about that first experience that your users get. Think about the ways that you may be inadvertently driving away a lot of contributors, and especially contributors playing life on a higher difficulty setting. People who are already tired from spending the whole day working in a second language, who are tired from being the only woman in the group or the only Indian guy in the group or the only British guy in this American group or whatever it is. People who are already feeling a little bit tired and on edge and unwelcome from all those other things. If they then hit that unwelcoming first response, they're probably gonna walk away and you've missed them. Okay, so a few other resources for people who are finding some of this chiming in with you. Um, the slides will be up later. You can click through to those. Um, if you want to know a lot of re reading, if you go to the Geek Feminism site and just follow off from that, there's a lot of information there, a lot of links to other resources. Um, there's a really good post on Medium about a lot of the reasons why women are not sticking around to the same extent as men in tech, why we're having a leaky funnel, and things that we can do about it. Um, there's a really good cracked post talking about some of the more societal issues that are causing us to miss out on people, causing issues in our society, and things that you might not be aware of. Again, if you're playing life on easy and you go into that first doom level and there's one monster and that's fine, maybe pointing out that what some of those other 50 monsters are that the people playing on hard are getting. Um, I would really suggest, now that you have seen a diversity talk from a straight, middle-class white guy, and hopefully didn't get too terrified, since only about three people walked out, please go and see a diversity talk from someone whose diversity is not just, hey, I'm a British guy that spent six months in France. Please go and see a diversity talk from people who have experienced all of it, who have played life on medium or hard for more than six months. Hear about the real problems that they've been facing and the real things that we've got to do. It's not just enough to say, I put up a contributing page and now I'm going to get all the women and all the people from India and China joining in. We have to make changes ourselves. We have to be more welcoming, more accommodating. We have to do some work. And we have to know why and how. And it will have big effects on our project. It will make things better. So now that you're hopefully a little bit more aware, please, please go and see one of the other diversity talks going on. Please learn more about the issue. I'm hoping that some of you will have seen ways that you can personally profit from being more aware from diversity. So even if you walk out of here not interested at all in bringing more people in, you will hopefully be a slightly better project member, slightly better employee. But if possible, also try and make the world a better place, make your projects a better place, learn a bit more, get more involved. It is almost lunchtime. Almost. Um, if anyone would like to ask a question, I may be able to answer it. Uh, if it's on living in France, probably. If it's on any really hard diversity problems, probably not. Um, also, if anyone would like to suggest any more learning resources, please let me know. I can add an extra slide on the end before I post the slides. Um, anyone interested in getting more women involved who's new to this stuff? 
Um, there's a really good book called Unlocking the Clubhouse, which looks at ways to get more women involved in computer science and education. And it was jointly written by the Carnegie Mellon Computer Science Department and I think Sociology Department, but certainly one of the um, other departments that knows a lot about this stuff. And I found it a really fascinating read about some simple changes that could help and help all sorts of people and some things that people were doing without understanding that were actually really quite bad. So have a read of that one. Have a read through some of the other things linked from it. Um, it's good. Just spend some time. Read, learn. Talk to people who aren't like you, but please don't do it in a scary way. Don't go, hey, you're the one woman in the room. Tell me about all women, because as I've mentioned, if someone comes to me and be like, hey, you're the one British guy in France. Tell me all about Britain. It's, it's kind of scary. I mean, it'd be nice. Have a friendly chat. Learn from them. Be welcoming. Don't, don't kind of point them out as the odd one out and scare them. OK? Anyone have any questions? Uh, not a question, but a comment. Yep. Um, I, I thought it was interesting what you were saying about people that are speaking second language all the time, getting really tired. The same thing happens with people who are speaking their native language but are, have strong introvert tendencies. You know, if you're in an office where everyone goes out at 5 or 6 out to the pub, get drinks, um, that person a lot of times just wants to go switch off. Yep. And, you know, they're not being antisocial, they don't hate their teammates or whatever, they just need downtime. So it's a similar sort of situation, I think. Yeah, if you're, if you're trying to do a team building thing, and you think that a great way to do team building is to take everyone to the pub after work and give them free beer. That's not going to be popular with people with caring commitments, people who have to pick kids up from school, single parents, people who are introverts and really hate going out with all those people, people with ear problems who can't be in a loud bar trying to hear, people with alcohol and other substance abuse issues that don't want to put themselves back in that situation. There's all sorts of different reasons why what works brilliantly for you as a team building thing is not automatically going to work brilliantly for everyone that you're trying to encourage. And if you're not careful, your team building event will turn off a lot of people and make them more unhappy than they were to start with. Just kind of be aware. Don't say, hey, everyone, we're going to go to the pub. Try and find out what people are actually going to want to do and work around it. Um, I know when I was out, I've got a, a team in India. The first time I went out there, I was like, hey, should we do this? And they said yes. And it turned out that they didn't like it, but they were a bit too polite to say no. So the next time I was like, we should do something. What, what are we going to do? And they went, last time we went to the pub. And I was like, yeah, but is that what you want to do? Or you know, should we do something at lunchtime or in the evening? Is it better to do it midweek or on the weekend? And the answer actually turned out to be that they wanted to go to this really nice new Indian restaurant that had opened up around the corner that was a bit expensive that they'd heard good things about. And they wanted to go at lunchtime so that they could all still go and pick up their kids on the way home from work. So that's what we did for the team building thing. And I'm like, but that's not what I'd have chosen. But actually, everyone's now really happy and smiley. And then they did a load of work in the evening when their kids had gone to bed that they wouldn't normally have done. Huh. OK. So just don't assume that everyone is automatically like you, even if they look like you. And really don't assume they're like you if they don't look like you, if they don't sound like you. Kind of be welcoming. And I think there are resources online for kind of doing um, events in the evenings at conferences that are more welcoming to all sorts of different people, how to run tech evangelism events that don't assume that everyone is, I don't know, in the Bay Area, free on a weekend, has no kids. That, that does seem to be a surprising issue I see in a lot of our open source stuff where they're like, hey, who wants to learn our thing? Come along on Saturday in San Jose. And they're like, well, I'm not in San Jose. And if I was, maybe I'd you know, 
have other plans or some kids or parents that need looking after or any of these other things? And they're like, I wonder why we only got white guys aged under 35 to come along. It's like, I don't know, maybe because you kind of self-selected by the event you ran. Some of these things are going to be really hard. There are people that are going to be tough to reach out to. There are going to be things where the best event you can run for one group is going to be the worst event you can run for another. If there was a silver bullet, then my talk would have had a very different title, probably involving the words silver and bullet. Just kind of work with your team. Work with your community. Try and find out what's going to be best for them. Then look and see what other resources exist online. Go and talk to other groups. Be like, I'm trying to do a POI event, but POI is not that cool. But hey, Tika's quite similar to POI. Let me go and ask the Tika guys what they're doing. And hey, maybe we'll just do one joint event, and then we'll learn from them. And just find similar groups, learn, share. That's another thing. If you found something that does work, let other people know. We have one minute left until we get thrown out. And you're all looking a bit stunned. OK, thank you all for coming. Thank you to everyone except the three people that left for not leaving. <laughs> thank you.